Jesus, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this morning that you have made, not by the hands of man, nor his desire his heart. Lord God, because you are holy and above all things. Lord Jesus, you see into the very hearts of men. You see the beleaguered burdens that they carry. You see as well the twisted fate in which they pursue and you give us all an opportunity a pause father God to recognize that you are the creator Lord God the lives of men are often adhered and observed and honored before the truth of the living God sometimes we are so committed father God to keeping the myths the punditries and commentary of our fantasies alive and well that we will go to any extent necessary to chastise, to invade, to destroy. Lord God, in those moments when we have separated ourselves from you, in those moments when we have made the world greater than you, I ask right now that you forgive us of our sins and our transgressions, Lord God. I ask right now, Father God, that you lift us out of the miry clay of our sin and deceit and hopelessness and place us on the solid rock of Jesus Christ, in whom all creation was made for and by. Lord God, for those who suffer this evening longing for friendship, may they find a friend in Jesus. For those longing, Father God, to find the wholeness of healing, may they find the healer in Jesus. For those, Lord God, that know that they are in the depths of their most hopeless life, they have turned to the left and turned to the right. They have turned themselves completely around and there is none but themselves alone in their corner. Their addictions have chastised them. Their commitments to sin and death have overtaken them. And they, like a drowning man, lift their hand out of the water expressing for the last time that they're going under and they're claiming a need for your help. Lord God, I ask right now that you touch their outstretched arm and that you pull them forward and up and out of their misery and into the joy of Jesus. Lord God, for the wretched that have been elected to office that have lost their way seeking, Father God, their own power and authority and wealth and influence, seeking status beyond their responsibilities and duties to the state. I ask you right now, Father God, to forgive them and to point them in the direction known as Jesus, upon whose shoulders our governments rest. Lord God, I ask you right now, as you know that I am not a perfect creature, but I seek the perfecter. I seek the one that will lay my pathway before me, that will wholeheartedly chastise me when I go asunder and will encourage me when I stand fast. 
Lord God, I ask you right now to clean my heart. To open my eyes to who you are. To surround me with your music and your glory. That those who have been injured and hurt along the way, those that have forgotten and for gone amiss, Lord God, they might see a light shining on a hill. That they might know what the salt of the earth tastes and flavored of. Lord God, that you forgave me and that they can also be forgiven. I pray right now for distant friends and for close enemies. I ask you, Father God, to show them love, a love so impeccable that you're willing to go beyond even the confines of heaven to the throws of ways of life here on earth. And that you would go to a cross. That you would go to a cross for a man as wretched as myself. And then, looking down, only ask. Deny yourself. Pick up your cross. And follow me. May I walk in your resurrection power this day as we study your word and show ourselves approved. In the matchless name of Jesus Christ, I say amen. I want you to understand something. No matter how confident you are, there will be moments in your life where there is an immense amount of doubt, fear, trepidation, a sense of utter hopelessness, a sense that you are completely isolated from all the world. I want you to understand that you are not alone in this. For the Father, who has heard the vehement words of his child, I hate you, you don't love me, maybe the first time that you hear it, it just 
requires the enactment of a desire for physical punishment but a relief of the child of your presence is sometimes fashioned enough maybe it's the husband who questions whether you have the wherewithal to do what you do I am shocked that you can't balance the budget did you not know that we were out of milk how come you couldn't handle just that simple little thing maybe it's the boss who has to give the message to employees that Gosh darn, today uh, we're going to have to do overtime. It's a requirement in order to get the project out. See, you are weakling. You don't understand. Uh, you should have stood up to those people in the office and told us that we got to go home. Maybe it's the son who goes to his father and says, you know, Dad, I I want to be an architectural engineer when I grow up. And the father puts his newspaper down for a moment, looks across the breakfast table at his son and says, You's a gosh darn fool. You'll never be like that. You don't got enough brains to be that. Maybe it's the boyfriend who looks across the table with his girlfriend and says, I think I can take care of you and a child. And the girlfriend looks back and says, I don't believe you have what it takes to raise a family. You see, sometimes votes of no confidence are the worst things that you can possibly hear. They emit a sense of anguish, a sense of disdain, a hopelessness. And I, I want to thank Mary Brockman for being in our chat role uh, right now. Love you, Mary Brockman. But as a matter of faith, you, my friend who's listening today, are going to have to learn how to overcome votes of no confidence. Votes that say to you that no matter what you believe, whatever you've been installed with, whatever has been conferred to you on high, you're not going to be the one. And as such, because you're not the one, you would do senseless ridicule and heartbreak. No one should listen to you. But I want you to know, in heart of heart, God has raised you for this moment. I know what the rest of the world has said to you. I know you stutter. And you want to be able to sing in the choir, but no one takes you seriously because you stutter. They think you might stutter when you sing. This moment is for you. I know you want to give a speech but you're in a wheelchair and people are not taking you seriously how can you give a speech uh, at the podium and the podium is bigger than you this is what you're dealing with and I want you to understand this moment you were made for how can she talk to all these boys and arrest their attention at the same time encourage them to be bigger and better than they've ever been how can she do this oh my god we need to find someone else I want you to know this moment was made for you 
I know he's been working with the company for 20 years, but I don't really think he can lead anybody. You see, you're not the only one who's had a vote of no confidence. You're not the only one who's been told that they were wrong. I want you to look at some scriptures with me today when it comes to the area of confidence. And then I'm going to tell you that if you truly want liberty to, liberty to reign, if you truly want freedom to spread, if you truly want to achieve, you have to turn off the volume of your critics and raise the volume of that still quiet voice that's still in your corner named Jesus Christ. And you're going to have to go places where you are alone. You're going to have to do things that have never been done before. You're going to have to take on challengers that are larger than Goliath. You're going to have to be able to speak to the conditions of people who feel you don't think or know what their conditions are. And not only are you going to have to speak eloquently to the problem, but you're going to have to also give the solution. And you're going to have to say it one or two or maybe three or maybe 40 or maybe 100 or maybe 1,000 times, but you're going to have to be steadfast and movable. You're going to be in such a situation and circumstance that it is going to be you who's going to look at the giant and say, you unclean Philistine, how dare you speak to the Lord Jesus Christ in this manner. You will be slayed in this hour. It's going to be you who has to do that. How do I know? Because it was me many times too. This is a matter of truth for you to know. I spent the majority of my life in urban conserv well urban progressive churches. Churches that have preached abortion, preachers who have spoken about unity but only amongst one race, people who have said that God is great but he can't defeat racism and they have belligerently spoken these particular things from pulpit to pulpit and when I have spoken against those things they have said I don't understand the black struggle I don't understand what it means to be black I don't understand what it means to be poor I don't understand what it means to be an American citizen and not to be looked upon harshly contented against. And yet God uses me every single day to break down those bricks thrown against me. Does it change my enemy sometimes? Sometimes not. But does it arrest one or two people from liberation? Harriet Tubman once said, I saved a thousand. But if they only knew they weren't free, I would have saved a thousand more. You, my friend, have to understand that liberators deal with three things first and foremost. Liberators first deal with the vote of no confidence. Then they have to deal with ignorance. And then they have to deal with lack of resource. Today I'm going to focus with you on no confidence. In the coming weeks I will talk with you about the other two. Ignorance kills. Harry Tubman made it very clear. 
I could have taken them all. But they wanted to be enslaved. Lack of resource. Some people who hold fish and bread look upon the fact that they don't have enough fish and bread to feed anyone else. And then God takes it, he breaks it, and he blesses, and he multiplies, and yet the fish and the loaves, they come back, and there is an abundance beyond which you can even ask or think, 12 buskets full that you got to take home. Confidence. What does it mean to have confidence? You know they talk about you need to have self-esteem, but self-esteem only esteems that which you have flaw in. If I'm flawed and I esteem myself that I'm a flawed man esteemed, I only look at my flaws. I look at what I don't have and it makes me angry that you have something that I don't. So self-esteem is not something that I want you to have. Self-confidence is something that you can have. But there's something that you need first, and that's a confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ to hear you. To know what you're going through. And to be able to liberate you. I want to go through some scriptures real quick. But before that, I want to give you some definitions, because you know that I'm the kind of person who likes to define things that we talk about so that you don't spend your time in great blustery trying to confuse people with ignorance confidence it goes back to faith really in all essence You can swindle people, which would be an adjective of con. Con being an adjective, you would swindle people. You can make make it uh, your concept in life to show people, yeah, I got faith, I got faith, uh, yeah, yeah, lots of faith. Mm -hmm. But faith presents fruits. And if you're rotten to the core, there is a con job being done. It maybe it's being done on others, but it's really showing up in your life. The con job. You see, you can't swindle faith. You can't make it look like you have faith. You either have it or you don't. A matter of faith is simply overcoming votes of no confidence. When we look at the etymology of the word confidence, you're looking at a noun. And the noun goes all the way back to the Latin. Confidere. Confidere. Not con, but com. Meaning together or with. Together or with. So confidence in the etymology of it all is to have full trust or reliance. To have absolute trust. Faith. I remember when I was in high school and they told me I had to climb a rope in the gym. It was a very long big rope or whatever. And if I didn't get to the top and touch the top then I had failed that course of action. Not in this particular case in terms of con. And there's a question of doesn't con mean a certain thing? It does mean against in the noun but we were looking at the adjective and in the adjective, con means that you're trying to 
assure based on insufficient grounds that you are not really certain of something but you're faking the funk and so that's why I looked at the adjective rather than the noun con would be against in the noun phrase of it I was told that I had to climb the rope and get to the very top touch the top bell and come on back down the rope unless I failed the class well as I was climbing the rope, I began to look down. And as I looked down, I began to see people cheering for and cheering against. My gravitational force was not towards those who were cheering for me, but to see those who were cheering against me. And I began to focus steadfastly on what they were saying. He's too short to make it. He's not going to make it. He's too big to make it. You're not going to get it up the rope. Get up the rope so the rest of us can do And the constant barauding of what you could not do, what you could not achieve, what you could not accomplish. It kept flowing over me and I began to listen to them and halfway up I began to decide for myself, decide for myself what I could not do. I decided that I wasn't going to make it to the top. I was halfway up. I was getting frightened. Fear upon me that little mat on the floor, how will it catch me if I fall? How can I make it to the top? I am too big. I am too short. I don't know what I'm going to do. My hands are too soft. <coughs> I'm not going to be able to achieve instantly. The assurance on insufficient grounds was there. Yes, I had done a con job on myself. I assured myself that I would fail because I began listening to and believing those who did not believe in me. I want to say that to you one more time. I began listening to and believing those who did not believe in me. I want you to understand something. Jesus never spent too much time around people who, he, who didn't believe him. Why argue with a fool? If God told you last night in a dream that you are going to be the owner of a bank and that you will be very prosperous in your life and you turn around and you say, oh, that's not a dream from the Lord. That's just a fantasy. That's, it'll never happen. That kind of stuff doesn't happen to me. You have insufficient grounds to assure yourself upon and you have done so. I want you to know I came down that rope, my, my hands began to burn, and then I let go and I fell on the mat. Do you know the mat was soft enough to take my fall? But my faith was not great enough to get me to the top of the rope. God has some major things. Thank you, Mary. You're right. If I had been deaf, I would have made it up. <laughs> God has some major things for you to accomplish. But who are you listening to? Vote of no confidence. Agador, glad to have you here. But I also want you to take a look at what vote is. Because we're in election season. Vote is a, in this particular case, an action but I'm going to also give you both the now you'll see how this works out how the action becomes the reality when you look at vote as a verb it means that you're making a vow to do something now, let me just go ahead. Pardon me. And put vow up on the board for us to understand. For those who are following along at home, uh, we're at the exceptionalconservativeshow.com. You can go there, you can see the notes for today's study. And this is an American Conservative's exploration of the inspired Word of God. So glad that you could be here with us today. 
when you make a vow, you're making a solemn promise. So that vote of no confidence that can either come from you or from someone else, you are making a vow, a promise, a solemn promise. Your promise can supersede the promises of God. My promise can supersede the promises of God. His promise never left. But because I did not believe in it, because I did not think it would come to pass, I forfeited that vow that came from the Lord himself, and I went with my own vow. I am pledging to myself, thank you, Dave, failure. Now, I want, I want you to understand something. There are individuals who pledge to themselves every single day to fail, and they hope that you do too, because they can't believe that there's a God that so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have eternal life. They can't believe it and some of them are wearing robes and preaching from the pulpit. Not me, Lord. Somebody else. But God is saying you and you alone. I have called. It's when you make a promise. Now in the Latin, Voltum, you're looking at a promise to a God, solemn pledge, dedication, that which is promised, a wish, desire, longing, prayer. I long for the prosperity of my city. But if I sit on the sidelines with the wealth of wisdom God's given me and the abundant ability to do those things which he says I can accomplish, then what good is it to have the wealth of resource? What good is it? of no effect. Remember, you're looking at the vote of no confidence. You're looking at the fact that there is a lack of resource. God is saying that my promises are yea and amen. Meaning that I am the only one who could keep the vow of covenant in the old and the new so that you may be entered into a relationship with me on a personal, intimate basis where I could actually speak to you so that you could believe in me as I believe in you. Did you know the Lord Jesus Christ believes in you? Yes, you. God believes in you so much that before the foundations of the world he chose you to be his child, to be his son, to be his ambassador upon the earth. I spent this weekend speaking with an ambassador's son about economic development in East of the River. We're going to talk on Wednesday at noon on how to make that happen. There were people in the room who told me maybe we shouldn't go up and talk with him. There were people in the room who had told me maybe we shouldn't even go to the event. If I had listened and believed what they said about me and what we should do at this event, Wednesday would not have been promised. So I want you to understand something there are votes of no confidence coming to you every single day. And, 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 and if you're just newly married, trust me, just another round corner will come a vote of no confidence. How you react to it tells me everything you need to do to overcome it. Let's take a look at some scripture real quick. I want to take you to Blue Letter Bible. You know it's the tool that we use every time that we come on the air. And I'm so glad that Dave and Mary is in here. It's 1 o'clock in the morning, and, and by golly. And we have even viewers. Oh, my goodness. Glory be to God. Some people are listening and understanding. Before you go to work this morning, you need to listen to this Bible study. 
Before you go to work this morning, you need to listen to this Bible study. Because your confidence is not going to come from man. It's only going to come from God. And when God-fearing people hear God giving them promises, and you meet up with another person who's God-fearing, who has God promise, and you're connecting, God's kingdom is being expanded on the earth. You ain't got to listen to all the naysayers at this juncture. God's already working his thing. When you're looking at the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, Confidence, which can be heard in forms of Kisil, Paisia, Peto, Pepetisos, and Hoopastasis. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. I want to get to the Hoopastasis, man. I'm jumping ahead here. The chief Hebrew word translated confidence is Batak. It means, perhaps, radically, to be open. Glory be to God. I know it's early in the morning, but some of us need to be running around the room at this particular point. Notice how the world says you, you have to have an open mind to receive it. Notice how the world says you have to have an open mind to receive it. And God is telling you clearly, your opening of mind is not for the world, it's for me. To be open. To be open to the power of the Holy Spirit. To be open to his will above all others. In order to trust God, you have to be open to him, not only voting for you, but vowing for you and watching you come through. you got to believe that with the little education he gave you, it's enough to do everything he ever expected you to do. I see people, and they have six degrees on their walls and have no degree of common sense. And I'm not putting down the field of education. By glory, get as much as you can. But if your wisdom is all up on that wall and there's nothing in your heart and there's nothing in your mind about Jesus, you have become closed to wisdom and open only to knowledge. And of all men, you are most miserable. God says, I want you to be open. Then he says, showing thus what originated the idea of confidence, where there was nothing hidden and a person felt safe. Nothing hidden. See, the idea of trust requires nothing hidden. You know, conceal and carry is a wondrous thing. It's a dangerous thing when you enter into a place of concealed and carry, and you did not know. But where there is knowledge that there's another person that may be concealing and carrying, I can restrain my behavior, and I'm trusting that that person will restrain theirs. See, confidence comes when there is nothing hidden with... I hid from God in that moment, in my own ignorance. I hid from God in that moment, and I said, God, I'm not going to make it up this. I, I didn't even talk to him. I told my mind, I'm not going to make it up the rope. I didn't ask God. I didn't think about God. All I thought about was, I don't want to embarrass myself and hit that mat having not touched the bell. My confidence wasn't in God. My lack of confidence was in me. I never approached God about whether he had confidence on me to jump that rope. But when I was a child, he told me, as I was sitting on the stairs, I was about eight years old, playing with my little army soldiers and men as the sun was shining through. He told me, someday you're going to own a bank. And you're going to bless a whole lot of people. Who would know that today, the Lord is raising me 
to build not just one now, but possibly two credit unions in the same year in Washington, D.C. Who but God? But I could not tell that to other people because they wouldn't believe me. And then I would have to deal with their coming back at me and telling me that it wouldn't be accomplished and then me never pursuing it. You see, we have to be open to the living God and we must be willing to hide nothing. That is how you become safe in the presence of the living God. There's nothing hidden. Where there is nothing hidden and where I'm open to the living God, I now have trust. So when do I have trust? Trust doesn't come because I want something to happen. Trust doesn't come because I need something to happen. Trust doesn't come even when I desire something to happen. Trust comes when I have opened my mind clearly and state that I am closing out on the world to listen to what God has for me. And I'm going to do the will of God no matter what comes my way. I have a cousin who is a professor, PhD, who's spending his time right now berating me with photographs of the Black Panthers feeding poor, impoverished children in their communities from the 60s and 70s, and telling me that the Black Panthers meant no ill. Six degrees separated from God, full of wit and wisdom from the world, ignorant of the living God. You can't put your trust in men. Gang members and drug dealers and criminals of all types, political and financial, have always done one thing to prove themselves to a people who don't understand what it means to have trust. All that you have to do is feed the poor, clothe the naked, and visit the people in the prisons, and you have religion. And the world practices religion every single day, but they're not practicing Christ. In fact, Christ is a null, avail, null avoid. You see, all they want is to be able to continue their terrorism of you and your families and your community and so what they do is they build allegiances between themselves and individuals who are going to count their faith by the fruit that you bear or at least give them this particular day. This is why Jesus says to you, do not focus on feeding a man a fish, but teaching him how to fish. Those who are self-sufficient become warriors for God, those who become deficient and seek their substance from those who do evil will become dependent and destroy the gospel itself, or at least the presentation of the gospel. Mind you, we have to always be open, but our openness is not to the world, it is to the wisdom of the living God. Wisdom that comes from not only knowledge, but also understanding. Wisdom that says, I put my trust not in what a man says, and not even what a man does, but in whom a man believeth. When you look at Psalms 118.8, you get a understanding of where God sees trust going. You're right, Dave. Ritual practice is meaningless to God. <clears throat> Politicians practice it. Drug dealers practice it. 501c3s practice it. Does not believe they believe in Jesus Christ. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. 
118 9 it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes it is better to take refuge in Yahweh than to put confidence in princes is the original intent of that writing in Psalm 65 5 O God of our salvation thou art the confidence of all the ends of the earth so wait a minute wait a minute O God of our salvation wait a minute why am I looking at the Black Panthers who have put their faith in themselves and not in God are they the God of my salvation are they the men, the disciples that will lead me and guide me to all truth? <coughs> Am I to know the Holy Spirit by a man who wears a black leather outfit and a black leather glove and raises it above his head to speak about the oppression of his people when not all of his people are oppressed and many of his people oppress the people within? Am I supposed to put my faith and confidence in men no, God says, O oh God of our salvation. Salvation doesn't come because someone gave me a bag of groceries for a day. The meat of my salvation is his faith. Not my faith, but God's faith. Miptek was translated confidence, and when you look at Job 18, 14, it reads, His confidence shall be rooted out of his tabernacle, and it shall bring him to the king of terrors. Job 31, 24, If I have made gold my hope, or have said to the fine gold, Thou art my confidence. Proverbs 21, 22, a wise man scaleth the city of the mighty and casts down the strength of the confidence thereof. Confidence. Do you have it? Most importantly, do you have it in yourself? Not self-confidence because you know how flawed you are. but confidence that God so loved the world and that he made you his ambassador to the world and that you are not to stand on Mars Hill seven or eight days in a row but you present the gospel where it receives seed and it grows and it bears much fruit you walk and where it's thrown away and cast asunder you walk away from you've done all that you can do and you shall do no more. Confidence is God's vow and his belief in me is even stronger sometimes than my belief and my promises to him. But I'm going to hold on tight to him because he is able to keep me through all that I will go through. I'm going to run out of time here, but I want you to understand that there are going to be five things. Five things that are going to help you get rid of your addiction to self-confidence and help you invest in God confidence. Can you, can you bear with me for just these for only a few moments? Number one, you got to know your limits. When I was young, I thought I could do all things. I jumped from the second floor of a house uh, down onto the ground, didn't break anything, rolled away, and I was just cool. I am not invincible. I am not omniscient, and I am not omnipotent. The older I get, the more aware I become of how invincible, lack lacking how vincible actually I am I know my limits in my relationship with my wife I have to know my limits I have to know that I'm not the one who can do everything she's got to do some and you know what 
She can't do everything. I got to do something. I have to know my limits. When I go to work, I have to know my limits. I can't solve everybody's problem. I'm not there to be the counselor. I'm just there to do my job. If they want to talk with me about Jesus after church or after work, we can do that. But I got to give my nine to five. I have to know my limits. Lunchtime? Sure, we can talk about Jesus. No problem. Oh, you want to talk about Jesus right now? No, let me take care of this right here. And then at lunchtime, we can sit down and we can talk. We can talk all about know your limits. Knowing your limits helps you place less confidence in yourself and more confidence in God. But see, kid, I should have talked to that person right then and there because that person never came back and talked to me. Well, maybe they weren't involved. Maybe they weren't concerned about Jesus. Maybe they just wanted to bend your ear long enough to keep you from doing what you have to do. Oh, wait a minute. Ain't nobody praying with me. Number two. Because you gotta know, ladies and gentlemen, if God's told you to do something in life, you can't just be dilly dallying, dilly dallying around not doing it. Uh, talking about you were doing something for ministry. No, no, no. God told you to go straight ahead uh, and keep walking and, and you decide you're gonna do the I'm doing it for Jesus no you're not in spite of Jesus you're doing it number two you have to know your values now it doesn't matter what you say from the pulpit it doesn't matter how many times Michael Hughes and Facebook tells me that the Black Panthers fed the poor the Black Panthers were a criminal organization their founder even said it Bobby say. So I'm not going to sit here and argue with you. I know what my values are. I start with Jesus and I work my way right on out. If your arguments don't fit with Jesus and they work their way on out, you can yell and you can scream. I I've gone and I've got <laughs> my wife hates going places with me, but I went into a restaurant one day uh, for breakfast uh, and the gentleman said, Prove to me that abortion is wrong. And I proved it to him uh, biblically. And he grew so irate, he almost had a heart attack on the table. He was yelling and screaming. His family tried to. But listen, I worked my way from Christ right on out. What were you doing? You cannot tell me that Jesus said abort your baby. Nowhere in there. Know your values and stick to them. No, I don't get invited to my family. But you know what? Jesus was willing to sacrifice family reunions. He was willing to say, hey, you know what? My mother and my father, my sister and my brother, I know who they are because they do the will of my father. Because I'm about my father's business. So if I don't get invited over to the hot dog festival or the or the crab eat out, or whatever. If I don't get invited over for Christmas, I'm all right with God. Because he's made a vow to me, and he voted for me, and I'm vowing with him, and I'm voting with him. Listen, you got to know your values. And the originator of your values, so you don't give them up so easily. Number two, you got to get some skills. Number three, I'm sorry, you got to get some skills. Your skills don't come because... You know, you all that a bag of chips you put on a nice dress and you look good. You got to use these. The Bible says he's made my fingers for battle, my hands for war. Baby, I'm, every single day I'm working it. I'm working it when you don't think I am. And I'm working it when you don't think you see anything I'm doing. I'm getting results that you will never believe from people you never thought would give them. For a purpose that only God knew. So I don't mind if you slight me. I don't mind if you curse me. I don't mind if you treat me any other way. I'm going to love you with the love of Jesus. Because I know where I got my skills from. Listen. I'm going to go over and forgive me for those who are following on home. But this is very important. There were times in my life. Where I did not know what God wanted of me. And yet I did what he asked me to do, and I didn't like it. I worked at a 7-Eleven 
from one o'clock in the morning to seven. No, eleven o'clock in the evening to seven o'clock in the morning. And I was taking trash out, and I was putting hot dog buns on, and changing coffee or whatever. But I was serving people and showing them a smile during the course of the day. Jesus was saying, maybe listen. Between 11 and 7 when the cab drivers are here and the police officers are here and the third shift is here, maybe my people would just need to see a smile. After all the hard stuff they've been through through the night, if they just see your smile, just make you laugh, just make you excited about getting back out there, maybe that's enough. He made me work at a Blue Cross and Blue Shield to talk about health insurance. How was I supposed to know that later on I would be enrolling people in Medicaid through a reform program? Yes, Dave, that's the stick-up shift, but I was there in the stick-up shift. People know. People know the 11 to 7, that stick-up. Never got stuck up. In fact, the week Bef the week after I left my job, there was a stick up. That's what God had. I'm telling you, I'm anointed and appointed. God has carried me when I couldn't walk. And even when I'm walking, God's carrying me. What I'm saying to you today is that you got to get over. Overcome the vote of no confidences in your life. There's a reason for that. From Blue Cross, went on to go work at State Farm. And at State Farm, I fought against the prison. Who would know that I was fighting against the prison? But the gentleman who would later become a member of the D.C. Control Board, and he asked me, he said, son, I need you to work for me. I've seen what you can do in just a short span of time. It was you who was working real hard. You shut down that prison. I want you to work for me. And I had a vote of no confidence. He can't mean me. He ain't talking to me. <coughs> I know I'm sitting in his living room. Very beautiful living room and ornate furniture. I, I know I'm sitting in his, I know what he's saying to me. I know what he's asking me, to, but not me. I know he's not talking to me. I worked at 7-Eleven. I, I, I walked home in the snow just to go pick up my baby from school. I, I, I had no car. I, I, he ain't talking to me. He called me two weeks later, and I said I, I gave my four weeks notice. He said, I thought I hired you the night I talked to you. Y you understand? God had lifted me up to become an overseer over the entire District of Columbia government. And I'm sitting there still in the prison with the baker and the butcher talking about, I know it ain't me. I know I'm not the one. I had a vote of, a vote of confidence from God through him and I didn't believe God. Left from there. Began working with the Federal Voting Assistance Program. Helping millions of soldiers around the world get their votes in on time. Teaching due discipline. And I know it ain't me. From all those years now, from the outside as a radio host and a financial counselor, through the open heart closed case campaign, I'm working on changing legislation in the District of Columbia. Who's carrying you? Who are you open to? Who are you open to? 
do you only get your thrills because somebody sits next to you and has faith enough to ask you questions or whatever and you feel that you all that? Or do you believe that God has you for himself, a treasure for himself that he wants to use appointedly as he a staff? He can pull his arrow out and fire you and you go exactly where he wants you to go. I know, I know. Get skills. Is all I'm saying to you. No matter where you get them from, every opportunity is a way is available to you to get skills to use what God has for you or to gain more, so God can use you even better. Get skills. And notice I said skills. It had nothing to do with education. You don't have to go to college to get skills. Number four. See others as people. See others as people. We are all in need. Some of us have found the answer in Christ Jesus. Others of us choose not to find the answer because we want to get a shortcut taken. No matter how they try to use you and manipulate you, no matter what they try to do to you, the enemy, no matter what, no matter what, no matter what, no matter what, see them as people. Imagine Christ to them. Even when they would do you harm. Now, I'm not telling you to sit there and be abused. That's not what I'm saying. I get so tired of people who like to try to twist people's words so they can make sense out of their own ignorance. I'm not saying to the woman who's getting beat by her husband, stay there, show him Jesus. That's not what I'm saying to you. You need to get up out of that camp as quickly as you can. Trust me, God will provide for your every need. He will open a door for you. Get out of there, save your kids so that you have a hope. And so that he might find one too. What I'm saying to you is, just as in that moment I saw people as people, see people as people. Sometimes the strongest rose is so fragile that when the wind blows, all the leaves are gone or petals are gone. And sometimes the things that look weakest are the most impenetrable. My friends, see others as people. Love them as you love yourself. What are the two greatest commandments? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all your strength, and with all of your mind. And what's the second? To love the neighbor as you love yourself. Love them. Love them. I've been cursed out before. I've been called everything, and that's sitting in the church. I ain't lying to you, sitting in the church. But I'm still going to be me. Do you. And love people. Be the last one here. I know it's a tough one. But it's one that will amend many a loss. Act. You see, <clears throat> I love Michael Hughes, and as much as I do, I love on him. You can put anything you want on Facebook because you know what? It'll scroll down eventually and nobody will ever see it again. I'm okay with you presenting your act of ignorance. Go ahead, present your act of ignorance. I don't mind you saying deliberative and ignorant things about me. I don't. Go. Say them. I don't mind you trying to justify a uh, argument that's uh, completely unjustifiable. But you, you go for it. That's not going to stop me from going on the air 
in preaching the word of God. That's not going to stop me from showing you the ignorance of your ways. That's not going to stop me from loving you enough to say no matter what you say, think, or do against me, I'm going to show you Jesus. And I hope someday to be able to match your Jesus with my Jesus. And that they are the same. No matter what you say, think, or do, I'm praying right now and forevermore that on the day that we open our eyes before the Lord, that I see you and that you see me. And that even more so that our focus isn't on each other, but on the Lord Jesus Christ and himself alone. Because when all things matter, when the libraries of Alexandria burned down, men didn't stop thinking or creating or writing. But when the anger and the ignorance is finally burned down, men will do what they were called to do many eons ago. And that is to worship God in the beauty of holiness. To know him and his promises and to know that they are yea and amen. To know that he loved you so much and he loved me so much and he loved all those who are listening to this right now so much that he did not forego his creation and destroy it. What he said was, I will send them a liberator. One that will bring them into reconciliation with me again. Because I can't look upon them in their sinful nature, but my son, whom is my beloved. And whom was called from the ordination of life itself. And even before the foundations of existence. My son, in Psalms Chap forgive me. Psalms chapter 2, forgive me. My son, who is spoken of in Psalms 22, my son, shall be your inheritance, and you shall be his. And he will make you ambassadors to all men. I tell you this. Act. Act not according to your will and to your way, but act in accordance to his will and his way. Hebrews 3.14 says, For we are made partakers of Christ." if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. 2 Corinthians 9, 4 says, Less happily if they of Macedonia, Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared. We, that we say not ye, should be ashamed in this same confident boasting. 2 Corinthians eleven seventeen, That which I speak I speak it not after the Lord, but as it were foolishly in this confidence of boasting. There are many people who have put their faith and their confidence in men. And they boast of their greatness because they have degrees on a wall and yet lack tolerance for wisdom. It is folly to think <clears throat> that we are not hurt daily by our own beratings and by the beratings of others. But I need you all to do me a great favor. I need you to go to Isaiah chapter 30 verse 15. 
and I'm going to put this in here. There are a number of scriptures that I want you to take a look at, and, and we're closing this out. And I know that I went over time, and I know people will say, hey, hey, hey you start late and you end late. Yeah. Forgive me. But I want you to take a look at these scriptures, and I want you to know the value of confidence <clears throat> cannot be emanated in the weight of gold or in silver. Isaiah 30, verse 15 says, For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, and returning and rest shall ye be saved, and quietness and in confidence shall be your strength, and ye will not. <clears throat> God saying, you ain't got to do a whole lot. Just be at peace with me, and I will prosper you. And some of us just won't believe that. Hebrews 10, 35. Cast on away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. Your confidence comes from God. Thus you must have confidence in God. Just because stuff doesn't work out for you, don't say that's not planned by God for you to achieve. There are lots of off ramps on the highways of life. <coughs> but every exit sometimes has another way of getting back on. Some put their trust in gold and in cars and other things. Job 31:24 says, If I have made gold my hope, or have said to the fine gold, Thou art my confidence. That moment in your life when you realize as they are taking away everything out of your apartment or taking everything out of your home that you have put your confidence in things rather than in God. There was a pastor who wrote a book and in his book he said uh, the church was doing poorly. Uh, we literally had put sank everything that we had into the church uh, and we lost our home. We had to move into an apartment, but God kept us. And then eventually, as our message began to get out, we began to grow. And not only were we able to grow a large church where we were with great many things being done out of that church, but I was able to travel and we got a house and we were on our feet again. Uh, and it wasn't an ornate house. It was. We didn't go for all that. It was a comfortable house for us. You don't have to justify God's gifts to you. But if you're comfortable, glory, glory be to God. What he was saying was, before our church and our ministry didn't grow because we put our confidence in what was in the tithing basket. But when we put our confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ, it didn't matter what was in the tithing basket. Everything else began to work for us. And we began to grow and expand and move beyond the limits of what people could even ask or think. Some people in your church right now won't give because you're too small for them. That's okay. Just keep praying over them. Bless them. Don't worry about it. Because God's going to open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing. Stay open, is what God's saying. <clears throat> but neither in gold nor in man, however great. Jeremiah 17, 5 says, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusts in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. God's saying, listen, I don't mind you trusting this person. But don't leave me. What did he say to Solomon? The same thing. Listen, don't go after the foreign women because you're going to be chasing Udi and everything else. And she look all fine and everything. But she she believes in Abba Daba. And Yabba Daba do. And that's going to take you away from Yahweh. <coughs> Nor in self as revealed in Christ. Ephesians 3.12 in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. I don't have boldness to the throne because of me. God ain't listening to me. 
He's listening to his word. And when I repeat his word back to him and his promises back to him, they're yea and amen. I got confidence. 1 John 5.13 These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know that ye have eternal life and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. 14th verse. And this is that. I know. I've always wanted to do that sermon. And this is that. And this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Proverbs 14, 16. A wise man feareth and departeth from evil, but the fool rageth and is confident. Philippians 3, 3. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. It's not the robe that's going to save you. It's not the preaching that's going to save you. Although the preaching is important because it delivers the word of God, but it's not the preacher himself. It is the spirit within the preacher preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ that saves the very soul. Don't get it twisted, bishop, pastor, apostle, teacher, uh, evangelist, whoever you are. Don't get it twisted. And, and, and you even have to add titles to that. Archbishop, this, that. Don't get it twisted. It ain't you saving. It's Jesus working through you. You just have an office with a nice desk. Don't mess that up. You are to have your faith and confidence in God. But in God. Psalm 65, 6. By terrible things and righteousness will thou answer us. We lost our 27-year-old daughter. I'm believing God's going to answer us. Either here or on the day that I see his face. I aborted two children in my lifetime. I'm praying and have prayed his forgiveness. And I want to see his face. And I want to see theirs. Great and terrible things happen. And believe it or not, you're not good people. There is none good but God. So I hate the question, why do bad things happen to good people? Because none of us is good in and of ourselves. Why do bad things happen to the people of God? Because your testimony will not be about how you achieved, but by how you overcome through him. By terrible things and righteousness will thou answer us, O God of our salvation, who art the confidence of all the ends of the earth, and of them that are afar off upon the sea. Proverbs 3.26 For the Lord shall be thy confidence, and shall keep thy foot from being taken. And 14.26 In the fear of the Lord is strong confidence, and his children shall have a place of refuge. There are children on the streets today who have run away from home. And they hear the voice of their pimp. They hear the voice of their friends. They hear the voice of the enemy. Someone sitting in a little circular tubing underneath the interstate waiting there for dawn to come because they ran away from home they don't see home as a safe place a refuge a place of strength of peace prosperity they see themselves being hurt and harmed their feet taken from underneath them they sleep with their eyes open and have been doing that for a long time 
They don't trust too many people. Steal what they have to just to get by. God saying, the reason why I gave you these hands, the reason why I gave you this mouth, the reason why I gave you these eyes, the reason why I gave you this hearing, the reason why I gave you that heart, the reason why I gave you those feet, the reason why I gave you this soul, is that you would have confidence that wherever I sent you as my ambassador, you have everything that you need, everything that you want, everything that you desire to meet the mission. The mission is not about your comfort. The mission is not about you feeling good about yourself. Oh, woe is me. I don't feel good about myself. I feel really down. Yeah, I know. There are going to be some up days and there are going to be some down days, but you got to get behind that. You have to overcome that. And I know a lot of people get offended when they say, get over, uh, get over it. No. Overcome it. Overcome it. No matter what you're feeling, do not allow the voice of the enemy. Do not allow anyone, friend or foe, to conjecture what God has told you to be. That you might be everything to that little person who's in that little tube right now, who's never had a hope because all they knew was that they had a beleaguering condition that they could not overcome in and of themselves. You are that bridge over troubled water. You are that help in the midst of the storm. You, my friend, have the ability to save a soul. I want to read something to you out of Jude and we'll call it a night. Or at least a morning. Jude one twenty says, But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And of some have compassion, making a difference. And others save with fear, putting them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. Whom do I put my confidence in? I put my confidence in the Lord. Mm -hmm.